now we turn to the second lecture, which is the has actually two interrelated topics. The first one is the size gradation of soil particles, and the second is soil classification. I explained in the last lecture that the size distribution of soil particles is the single most important property that soils have. Uh, if you want to understand the soil that you're looking at or you're considering to put your structure on top of, the size gradation is the single most important. It's not the only one, particularly with the finer particles. And there are other aspects we're going to talk about relating to soils as a granular material. But size is the most important. And we're going to take it up first as it is a property that you're going to see over and over and over again in soil mechanics. How do we determine um, gradation of particle size? We do it normal as currently we do it using sieves. And you see there an illustration of, of a series of sieves. They're not the only sieves we use by no means, as you'll see shortly. But they give you an idea. The sieve on the right is a 3 8 inch. And what that means is that the holes in the mesh are more or less 3 8 inch in, in size. I say more or less because obviously unless they're perfectly round, they're not going to have a uniform size depending on how you do corner to corner or face to face or whatever. And therefore, it's the, the concept is that the particles that are smaller than 3 eighths will pass through them. And then the next is the number 10, which has 2 millimeter openings. And then the next one after that, the second one from the left, is the number 40, which is a very important. And the last but not least on the far left is the number 200, which is a very important sieve. And we're going to, talk, we're going to see why here shortly. And what they show you, in addition to the sieve sizes, is the kind of particles you would expect to appear either uh, pat, you know, at or near those particle sizes. For example, the one on the far right at the bottom there is a medium gravel, and then next to it is a fine gravel, and then the next to that is a medium coarse sand, and then silt, and finally clay. So we use these sieves to separate the different sizes of particles in the soil. I believe that in the lifetime of most of you taking this course and or watching this video, many, or many of you taking this, watching this video, and most of you taking this course, we will see this change. We have the ability now to uh, determine gradation of particle size and such things as angularity, which we'll talk about in a minute, and other things, and shape and whatnot, by using laser technology. That, that technology exists. The problem always is in civil engineering, in general, and geotech in particular, is not the technology exists, but getting the industry to accept the technology. It take, it's a long, drawn-out process. And in the United States, it's principally through the ASTM system, although other organizations such as AASHTO and the Federal Howard Administration, and to a lesser extent than it used to be the military, uh, have our major players in this process. And one of these days, I believe we're going to see that happen. But changing technology is slow. I'm going to refer to that in this course and in Foundations about how changing the, how the technology we use very much influences the way we solve problems and how changing the testing technology will eventually move stuff forward. So with that out of the way, in any event, the concept is the same in both cases. We want to know in a given soil sample how what are what are different particles are there because most soil samples do not have this a uniform particle size there's a few we're going to talk about those and we, we have a specific name for those 
But most soil samples have a variety. They, it can range all the way from even having gravels and clays in one sample. That's a very broad one. But most soil samples do not have a uh, uniform particle size, which means, put another way, not all the particles are the same. Are, are, are the same. They can go from large to small. And we have to define what we mean by large and small and medium as well. So with that, with that in mind, we, need, we want to know in a given soil sample, what's the distribution? You know, how, what particles are you know, different sizes? There are two tests that we use. The first one is the sieve analysis. And the sieve analysis is, um, it, we're going to talk about that, is using a series of those sieves we just looked at. The other one is the hydrometer analysis. And we basically uh, use the, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a tricky test to run. And we normally use it for very fine grain soils. In fact, we exclusively use it for fine grain soils. To, by noting the changes in the solution of the soil and water and a dispersant, Noticing the, the change of the density as the soil particles filter themselves out. So, um, that those two, between the two of the sieve analysis, the more important of the two. And we're going to talk about how that, what, you know, the hydrometer is, is important for certain soil properties. Um, swelling is it's very important. Properties which in, in, expansive soils, properties where the for, where fine grain soils are to predominate usually will get a hydrometer analysis. The sieve analysis is simple. Um, it passes the soil samples through a series of sieves of very mesh fine. And we are looking at a very, and many of these illustrations come from government publications, the government using the tax money of you and your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents has come up with many different illustrations, some of which are primitive, but all of which are in the public domain. So I use them extensively. So you start with, at the top, for example, this series samples, you have two inches. You know, the openings are two inches. And particles that are smaller than that goes through that, they go into one inch. And then particles that are small go through that, uh, and half, they're in half inch, three eighths inch, the number four. We're going to talk about the numbers here in just a minute. Um, and when we're done with, when we're, usually those trays are all stacked together in a single stack. In other words, they, they, they look like they're separate. That's just for illustrative purposes. They're actually put together, compacted down. You know, actually fit. To, they fit together in a nice, tight stack, and they're shaken together. And as that happens, the smaller particles fall further and further down until they find an opening, if they find an opening, that is larger than they are. And then they pass through the next one, the next one, and eventually at the bottom, below the number 200, we have something called a pan. And the pan is basically a solid tray that catches whatever doesn't stay in the other ones. For example, let's look at, say, a half inch. The half inch has all the particles that have uh, that are between, say, a half inch and an inch in size. Three eighths is the same between three eighths and half inch, and those particles are said to be retained on a certain sample sample tray, and that tray is then weighed. And if we know the tear weight, or the tear weight being the weight of the tray or tear, whatever is holding it. Then we can take that, and we can, and then we, we we take that. We learn the weight of those particles. In theory, if we do all of these particles, we weigh them down to the pan. We should have, um, we should have the same weight in theory as we had for the sample we started with. In reality, we don't normally. We you know the closer the better. Normally, I believe. Um, well, the closer the closer the band, it will depend to some degree on the specification you're using. And in some cases, there's also the, the issue of the wash, which we'll, I'll talk about 
which, which is really more of a lab type of issue, depending on the soil. These are your U.S. standard sieve sizes. They, by the way, uh, tables, I use a lot of tables and graphs, and you see those. Those correspond, those are taken from the soils in foundations manual. You will see them, and they correspond with us. So you can actually follow along in the book, in this case, in a way that, uh, you know, without having to, you know, it's not just the slides. Those come out of the book, and you can just follow along that way, too. And you see from, you go down from the uh, standard sieve number from the number three. Now, that sieve opening is a quarter. From a quarter inch opening smaller, we have standard sieve numbers. And their ASTM has um, put those in there. Instead of saying, well, this is a quarter inch sieve, we say it's number three sieve. And instead of saying it's a... Um, for example, it's, um, what, 3 sixteenths, it's number 4 sieve, and so on, down to the two, 200. And you'll see that two, 200 is usually the smallest sieve we use. There are smaller ones, like the 270 and the 400. They're not used very often uh, because once you get very small, small particles don't, follow the same, don't normally fall through the sieves the way that larger particles do. Now, for you look at the very bottom, you'll notice that uh, for larger than quarter inch opening, we designate those by the size of the opening. Four inch, three inch, two and a half inch, two inch, one and three quarters, and all the way down to five sixteenths. So you have all of those openings which are and so, therefore, the larger sieves down to the uh, five sixteenths are all ga are all gauged um, are, all, are designated by the opening size, whereas large smaller than that, they're by the sieve number. Now, notice on the comments on the top table, there are some important breakpoints, and we're going to those are very important. Uh, the number four is an important. Breakpoint. It is the breakpoint between fine gravels and coarse sands, which we, which is important in the unified classification. Um, usually, we for compaction test, we'd use the soils that pass through that. Then the number ten is the breakpoint between coarse and medium sands. The number forty is a breakpoint between medium and fine sands, and also for the Atterberg limits, which we'll get into. The soil passing, all the soils we use in the Atterberg test are actually passed through the number 40. And last but not least, the 200 uh, sieve is the breakpoint between fine sand and silver clay. It's probably the single most important breakpoint, particularly in the unified classification. We'll see that in just a minute. These are what this nice sieve rack was. That was in Knoxville. You can see in the upper right hand corner you have a sieve stack in the sieve it's bolted down we have those in our lab at UTC and they're bolted down and the whole thing shakes the sieve um, down and, and as the particles fall through it they can also be shaken by hand there are some uh, you know there, there's both pluses and minuses of doing it that way usually we prefer to use to get uniform results we use a preferred mechanical sieve shaker. Now we have an example. It's taken from uh, Jumikas's book, which I th is, I'm not sure if you can see it behind me. It's somewhere. I have it somewhere. Which is a result sieve analysis. And we start with a sample which has 200 grams. Pretty decent sa size sample. And we put it in the number four, and we stack all those sieves up, and we shake them. And once we're done, we um, have already weighed every one of those. We've, we've weighed them all. And we know what they weigh. The soil weight is determined. We weigh them after the soil is in them. And the difference between the weight with the soil in them and without is, in fact, the weight of the soil that's in there, and that's what was recorded. That's what the retained on sieve column means. It means that we discovered that, for example, the number 10 sieve has 2.84 grams 
Number 20 has 5.66 grams. Number 40 is 46.04 grams. And so on, all the way down to the bottom. <clears throat> and each of those trays has that much soil in it. And ultimately, that we add all those up, and it weighs 200 grams. Ideally, that's what you're supposed to get. In the real world, you don't. You get a little difference. And the percentage of the total weight of each of those is simply the weight of each retained divided by the original 200 grams. So, for example, 2.84 is 1.42%, or 5.66 is 2.83%. Or 46.04 is 23.02 percent and so on all the way down so that's how we get that first double column retained on sieve the grams what we weigh in the lab the percent is the is the each weight divided by the total one expressed as a percentage at the very bottom you see that only 3.4 grams of soil hit the pan or 1.70 percent of the entire Wait, what that means is that this soil sample, that, that's important because the portion that's in the pan when it's all said and done is actually the, um, is actually the, is, is actually the percentage which is considered a fine grain portion of it. And if, in the unified system at least, if more than half of, of, of the, of the soil is in the pan, that means we're dealing with basically a fine grain or cohesive soil. Otherwise, it'd be a cohesionless soil. We'll talk about that shortly. And we're obviously in this case, very little of the soil is in the pan, so it's basically a cohesionless sample. Okay, with that out of the way, the percentages you see how they're computed retained. We start from the top. I take there's zero at the in the first in the first. That means there's no gravel at all in the sample. It all passed the number four. The number ten, you talk with the zero, which was retained cumulatively, you add the 2.84, and you get a cumulative retained of 2.84. You take the 2.84 and you add 5.66, you get 8.50 at the number 20 sieve. So, at the number 4 you see, if you take the 8.50 that's retained from the last one, you add 46.04, you get 54.34, and so on. You'll notice as you go down the stack, more and more of the sample is retained. And what that means is that for a given sieve, all the, the weight in that column, in the cumulative retained column, the weight is the weight of the samples that are in that sieve and all the sieves above it. And then you get to the very bottom and you end up with 200 grams. The percentage is simply those weights, again, divided by the 200 gram total sample weight multiplied by 100 to get a percent. So therefore, by the time you get to the pan, you got the whole sample. The cumulative passing is just the opposite. There's two ways of doing cumulative passing. One of them is to start at the bottom, work your way up like you did with the retained. So I start with 3.40 from the pan. I take 3.40 and add the 63.16 in the 200 sieve to get 66.56. I take that and add the 11.26 to get 77.82 at the number 100, and that's what's passed. Uh, and the percentages are, and you work the way all the way back up to the number four, where you get the 200 grams. You're, you're all of it, which means that all the sample passed the number four, which is obvious from looking at it. It's just another way of expressing it. The reason why that's important is because we norm is why that's, there's another way of getting that, by the way, before I go on. The other way is if it's easier to, you, you can, if you compute it that way passing, that's fine originally. If you compute it retained, then you take the retained figures, you, you, you take the 200 grams, you subtract the, re, the re, retained figure to get the passing figure. So for example, let's take the number 10, 200 minus 2.8. Uh, 84 is 
which is correct. Say for the number 60 Sith, you take 200, you subtract the 96.54 retained, and you get 101.46. It's the same. It doesn't, you can do it either way. Obviously, if you don't have to compute the percentage retained, then it's easier just to do the passing the other way. But you, in many cases, it's required to do both. And you, if you do one, you have the other one. They're mirror images of each other. Why is this important? Look on the right. Notice what you have is a semi-log um, graph. The semi-log graph on, at the, the, the x-axis is grain size in millimeters. And the, and the y-axis is percent passing um, or percent finer. We also, you hear the percent coarser and percent finer. Percent passing or percent finer by weight. And all this is done by weight. They're not done by volume. All the way from zero at the bottom to 100. And you simply take the cumulative passing numbers and you plot them on that. Now a few words to the whys. First, you'll notice that the sieve numbers and the sieve openings for the bigger ones are at the top. I furnish on my website that particular type of chart. It's possible to um, actually plot that using, a, you know, plot that in your spreadsheets. We customarily plot it in the semi log fashion showing that. It's I've not seen most of the results I've seen of that being attempted are uninspiring to be honest with you. It's a lot easier to use a pre-prepared plotting scheme and I have those available for download on my website where and you can get them other places as well that essentially has all the sieve openings and the sieve numbers you don't have to think about well let's see here now the number 200 sieve has 0 0.74 millimeter opening and blah 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 you don't have to think about that anymore you just use those sieve numbers and sieve openings and plot it and then you draw a nice curve we like to use you know some some interpolation you can also do a straight line between curves uh, if you like that, that's not insignificant because that will affect some other things down the road. Um, I talk more about the dangers of interpolation in my fluid mechanics lab course than I do in soil mechanics, but the dangers are just, they're there and they're just the same and they're just in their, their problem. So I would strongly suggest to my students and to, is to use pre-prepared plots. It's possible to prepare a spreadsheet to do it and have these nice numbers. I don't think most students really want to do that effort. And of course now many geotechnical software packages that analyze and plot lab data do all that for you. You just enter the numbers, you get a plot. I, I think that some experience in actually how those plots came into being is very important for a civil engineer. To, to know that. Okay. Classification of soils. We're going to do this in kind of a general way. And then we're going to talk about specific classification systems. Um, the shape of that grain size distribution curve you saw in the last slide, I'll go back and show it to you there, is very important. And it shows you um, those those slope parameters and, and it shows you the slope of that curve and you see in this particular case the slope is very steep once you get past the very large sizes it's, it goes down pretty fast and it said well you know that's great steep flat medium how do I do how do I um, deal with this well I deal with it by quantifying it, and as there's two important numbers. Equation 4.1 is the uniformity coefficient, and that brings up the issue of D numbers. And probably, the, let me see if I move, oh, no, not yet. Um, 
the D numbers. And the D numbers are basically, the, no, the D number is very simply the number that the particle size, you know, for which 60%, you know, D60, for example, is 60% or finer. That's what the D number is. It's the designation of how much is that percentage of us. So D60 is 60% or finer. D50 is 50% or finer. D40 is 40% or finer. Um, D10 is 10% is or finer. The uniformity coefficient is equal to D60 over D10. Um, the other one is the co curvature of the graviation or the cur curvature coefficient which is equation 4-2, which is D30 squared over D60 times D10. All of these, by the way, are in millimeters. D60, we, we express D numbers in millimeters. And in, But however, you will see that they are dimensionally correct and that both the C sub U and C sub C are dimensionless. So... Those, those are the two shape parameters we use in the classification process. And your book has an informal way of dealing with those. I'm going to kind of gloss through that and get to the more specific aspects of the unified system because I think it's a little easier to understand and certainly a lot easier to apply the rules consistently. Let's throw out some... Let's try to put some... Um, intuitive or, you know, try, try, try to make real some terms we use. First, let's talk about well-graded soils, upper right-hand corner. Well-graded soils have a nice distribution of particle sizes from large to small. It's, it's evenly distributed by weight. Poorly graded, the B, the bottom right, means that most all the particles are pretty much one size, and that's pretty much the end of it. And the best known, to, particularly to you students, of a uniformly or poorly graded soil are beet sands. Beet sands, the particles are pretty much all the same size. Gap graded soils are soils with a few sizes here and there in the distribution, and everything else is missing. As you see there, it's an extreme of some very large particles and some relatively small particles and not much in the middle, unlike the well-graded soils. We normally, in design, prefer well-graded soils. That's normally what we like to see with uh, cohesionless soils. Angularity. I mentioned yeah, angularity in brief. Um... And it depends on their geologic formation and how they've been weathered. For example, an angular soil is in the lower um, right-hand corner. It has a lot of asperities to it, a lot of sharp sharp edges and whatnot. Uh, then you have your subangular um, subangular soils above it, which are have still have asperities, but they've they, they've taken a little weather. And then sub-rounded, where the asperities are about ready to disappear, that's in the lower left-hand corner, and the upper left corner are rounded soils. And rounded soils are basically like pebbles and whatnot, you see, where all the asperities are going and their surfaces are smooth. We normally like to, to have angular soils because they have um, uh, better engineering processes. They have... Um, they can also they also affect the way what the kind of particles that can get through sieve and so they bias that a little bit. Um, rounded soils are have had erosion. In fact, river bottoms are a good place to find rounded soils, and a lot of that is not necessarily the water flowing in them. It's usually due to microscopic rock particles or tiny tiny soil particles really flowing over them, and they wear them out. This is kind of a different, and I want to just use these curves briefly. You see, first of all, the most important thing you see in this graph is how the D numbers are arrived at, how you compute D numbers. You start, say, the D60 in this particular case comes over um, 
This is on curve A. They give curve A as an example. D60 shoots over, it hits the curve, and then you go down to read the grain size corresponding to D60 in millimeters, which is about 0.6 millimeters. You do the same thing with D30. You start at 30% um, passing, you come over, you go down, and that's about 0.2. And then last but not least, the A, 10 comes over to there and it goes down 0 0.075, about the 200. Um, and that's how you use and compute the D numbers. So note that very carefully. It's a nice example of it. Uh, curve B is a gap grade. It comes down, then it goes flat, then it goes down again. And we have, you know, we, we can, uh, and that, that's a classic gap grade. Curve C is a classic poorly graded soil uh, where uh, most eventually goes and then drops and then stops. And that means that all pretty much large portion of the particles are in one, pretty much one size. Both curves, B, both gap graded and poorly, and poorly graded soils are considered poorly graded soils in general. And well graded soils are like curve A. For smaller than 200 sieve, we use the hydrometer. And this is Veroit's description of the hydrometer test. Um, it um, is a, it's kind of a tricky test to run, which is why you don't always use it. And in fact, uh, soil classification does not um, require the use of a hydrometer test. The, neither of the major classification systems do. I'm thinking about uh, the unified system and ASHTO. Neither one of them require hydrometer tests. A hydrometer test is very useful if you're talking about the, the properties of, of soils with very small particles in them. You need to know what that distribution is. And we're going to see some of those as we go along. One of the tricky parts of teaching geotechnical engineering is there's a lot of stuff you have to learn all at once. And, you know, there's all kinds of batting orders that topics are taken in. And this is one of those points. If I think about a soil sample and I pick it up, that's a dry soil sample. Let's start with a dry soil sample. Um, it's not a solid. It's a granular material. Here's, and obviously, this, it's easier to see with larger, the larger the grains you have. Let's think about gravel, for example. You have a gravel sample. You can see between the gravel particles, and we'll leave out for the minute, we have no water here. You see between the gravel particles that you have uh, gaps. What we call the formal term for that is voids. And the voids are, in a dry soil, fill with air. Uh, because it's not really a solid. Well, you can't see it, but small particles and large particles have that in common. If you were to be able to magnify what you see in smart particles, you'd see the same kind of voids that you see in the gravel. And true with gravel, true with sand, true with silt, true with clay. Dry. So those voids start out, if you have a perfectly dry clay, let's say you figured out a way somehow of injecting water into those in such a way that the disturbance of the arrangement of the clay particles is non-existent or minimal. Let's say you figured that out. You'd be pretty smart if you figured that out, but let's say you figured that out and you start adding water. The first thing that would happen is that the water would want to fill the voids up. And basically what would happen is, is that a certain part, certain um, volume of clay would just sit there. And it wouldn't expand, it would just sit there. Meanwhile, the water would be percolating through the voids and filling them up. You would reach a point somewhere where the clay, and of course with clay you have clay bonding. We talked about that the last time, where the clay particles tend to stick together. But you'd get to a point where 
the clay bonding would not be enough and the clay particles, you know, you keep adding water, sooner or later the clay would start, the particles will want to separate and the volume of the sample will want to expand. The point at which that begins is called the shrinkage limit. And then it keeps going to the point where you get to a point where the expansion is conti is continuous, but the particles change from a, a sort of a dry semi-solid to a plastic type of material. That's called the plastic limit. You keep adding water beyond that, you get to the point where the, the, the soil ceases to be a plastic and starts going to more liquid. That's called the liquid limit. And then you keep adding, and what you've got really is sort of a liquid phase of your soil. And as the water content of the soil increases, we'll define water content later, those, uh, th 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 those, those break points are important. So how do we determine those break points? First, we need to, before we determine how to determine them, we need to do better definition. We have the three shrinkage limit, the plastic limit, liquid I've discussed. We use, the more plastic a soil is, the more it will be compressible, have a higher shrink swell potential, we'll talk about that, and be less permeable. In other words, less likely for water to pass through it. Knowing these limits that helps identify and classify the soils, and the plastic limit can be in case been pre-consolidated, which we'll, uh, we talked about, I mentioned that the last time about pre-consolidation. There are a couple of other important quantities that we define. One of them is the plasticity index, which is equal to the li liquid limit minus the plastic limit. Um, one thing I'll mention about the plasticity index is that it's very easy to confuse the PI, the plasticity, with plastic limit PL. Don't. Don't do that. Um, use the, uh, um, make sure you know which one you're looking at. The liquidity index, which you don't see as much equal to the water content minus the plastic limit of the plasticity. And you don't see that as much. Um, it's the plasticity index is the more important of the two. It's an indicator of soil compressibility and potential for volume change. All clays, to some degree, um, change their volume. It's just a matter of how much. One important thing. PL, LL, PI, and LI are always expressed as, a, as percentages. In other words, we, we could say that, you know, you could copy a plastic limit of 0.20, 20%. We always use percentages with these. Also, don't get too happy with the decimal points on these either. I would not take them past one decimal point. And in many cases, the problems you have will, have, will just have integers. Uh, many students go to the it is 32.6875. No. no. The two tests that we use are called Atterberg tests. In fact, liquid limit and plastic limits are called Atterberg limits after the Swede that came up with these tests. These tests are delightfully primitive. Um, and, um, but that's what really makes them practical. This is how, let's start with the liquid limit test. You, you um, take several samples with varying moisture contents, and that's always a challenge in the lab. Uh, you can either start with a dry sample and add water to it or do like the Corps does, Corps of Engineers, and take a wet sample and dry some of them out progressively. The first one's a lot easier. You take the specimens, you place them in the bottom of a specially prepared cup, which is usually a bronze cup, um, and you flatten out the top, and then you split it with a grooving tool, or I guess in the 60s they call it a groovy tool. Um, and then the crank turned and the cup is impacted. In other words, basically you split the, the, the sample in half 
and basically the way that the crank lifts the thing on a cam and then it suddenly drops and it lifts it and it drops and it does so until uh, the groove is close. In other words, what's going to happen is is that as you keep lifting and dropping it, the two halves are going to want to come together. The basically the wall is going to want to, to the point where they close. When it closes, that's the liquid limit. If you close it 25 times. In other words, if you run the thing 25 times and the groove closes at that point, that's the liquid limit. There are a couple of ways of of um, actually getting at the liquid limit you know the idea of being able to prepare a sample and hit 25 is i mean if you're good at it, you've, you've got experience you can do that the formal way is to you know take the different moisture contents um test them all see and then draw a line between the results and where the moisture content crosses 25 that's the liquid limit there's also a one point test you can use as well. So you can do it either way. Um, but it's, it, that's when, when you've got, when, when, if you hit that thing 25, if that thing hits the deck 25 times and it closes, that's your liquid limit. The plastic limit, you um, samples prepare at varying moisture contents again. You roll them out on glass to a 1 8 diameter. If the pencil which we call it um stays together then you need to roll it up in the ball and while you're doing that you eliminate you know you're, you're actually taking moisture out of it and you roll it out again and when you get to the point that this the, the rolled samples crumbles then the moisture content at that point is the plastic limit um you don't necessarily have to use glass. I've seen some of your geotechs in this area at least use roll out on paper to decrease the moisture content, kind of speed things up a little bit. Whether you, you know, again, there's a lot of one of the things you're going to find with geo, lot, all geotechs, particularly is local, and you're going to find that a lot of people that actually do lab work take a lot of shortcuts. Because if they're if they're used to doing with the same type of soils over and over again, they'll know stuff, to, and that's very that's actually very useful, because that can save a lot of a lot of trouble, you know, make your makes your interpretation more accurate, and saves you a lot of time. Let's for our purposes take an adverb. Say you've got a soil with the following. You go through all that. Called LL over is equal to 23 and P over 18. First, find the plasticity index. And the second is the shrinking unit is the Holson Kovacs quick and dirty method. I'll explain what both of those terms mean in just a minute. Um, the PI is pretty simple. You take liquid limits, subtract plastic limit, 23 minus 18 is 5. That's it. That's the plasticity index. The plastic limit, as you can see, is 18. These are very different. Holson Kovacs method. Holson Kovacs, um, I know that I think one of them is still living. Um, the, in the early 80s, they put out a book on soil mechanics, which for particularly for people for, on, in terms of practical soil mechanics is one is a classic. And they'd recommend this method. They do it graphically. I converted it to a uh, using a little... Um, interpolation I converted it to a formula and it's kind of a quick and dirty method it's a way of estimating this to test for shrinkage limits you have to use mercury in this test it's a real mess um, and it's always been my objective in student labs uh, or labs in general but student labs where I deal with to get rid of the toxic substances this is not good not good so you take the shrinkage limit equal to this formula, which you, which you see, you just plug and chug. You get a shrinkage limit of 17. The shrinkage limit must be below the plastic limit. It must be. Um, if it's not, then the quick and dirty method doesn't work. But this is a nice, a good way of estimating what the shrinkage limit is.
Another th fact about cohesive soul is um, consistency. You have consistency means this, it's basically a sort of an inf it's sort of a broad term which defines its strength. And there are a number of ways. One of them is the um, unconfined compression, the QU, which uh, we're going to talk about that later on in the course. It's basically a compression test on a sample, kind of like you do with concrete. Um, standard penetration value is something else we're going to talk about as well. And you can also estimate the unit weight. Clays are notoriously unreliable for consistent results. So these are only good for back of the envelope preliminary estimates. You need to understand the clay soles that you're dealing with when you're designing stuff to go on top of them. Otherwise, you can get into big trouble in a hurry. There are basically three methods we're going to look at to classify soils. Well, there's quite a few of them, but actually only two. The first one is the USDA method. It's primarily developed for agricultural and surface soil purposes. Uh, what we have at the soil, surface of a soil, at the top soil and whatnot, is important. For agricultural and other types of purposes, but we don't use it very often in soil mechanics. The unified classification system goes back to the Second World War. Arthur Crossagrani, who taught at Harvard, developed it primarily for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Their problem was this. They were in the process, as the war proceeded, to design and build airfields in various parts of the world and they needed some kind of rational consistent system in order to have those uh, you know so that the, they would not have problems less like soft spots in the airfield because air, aircraft when they land like to have nice hard flat surfaces and you've got a washboard it's not pretty so, but their methods of doing so, of evaluating the soils, were inconsistent. So, Cotter came up with the system. It is the most widely used classification system. It has been the mo modifications to years have been fairly minor um, in the greater scheme of things. And um, they uh, is is today the leading classification system. The ASHTO system originally was developed in the 1920s as the Bureau of Public Road System. Its primary purpose is aimed at classifications for pavement purposes. It can be used for other th for other things. It's not used. Very, it sometimes is used for other purposes, but not very often. The USDA system is simple. It's got sand, silt, and clay. And the uh, percentages of each are um, are shown are shown there, and you know, okay, if, you know, different percentages are going to have different types of different types of soils. Again, we don't see it very much used in soil mechanics. The unified classification system attempts to break down soils or and virtually all soils into a two-letter code. The primary characteristics are on the left, you have gravels, which we've talked about, sands, clays, silts, or gang soils. Except for the last two, which kind of tend to break the mold and don't quite go by the book, in many cases, those primarily look at soils from a purely you know, you know for, for, again, the particle size is the main driving force behind those primary characteristics. Second char the secondary characteristics depend upon what end of the classification. If you're on the cohesionless end, the, the large grain, large grain size soils, it's either well graded, the W's, or the P, the poorly graded. As things start getting smaller, I, the particles keep getting smaller, you start wondering whether the small particles are primarily silty or primarily clay. Um, and though we'll talk about how to get that. And then into 
purely clay soils, you have uh, lean clays, which have less than 50% liquid limit, and fat clays, which have a greater than 50% liquid, liquid limit. So the last, the MCL and H, are primarily um, characteristics of, of fine-grained soils. Silty soils tend to do not have the clay bonding to the extent that clay soils do. And that's the, the big difference between them. All right. The classification system is basically either is a, a, pro, is a process of elimination. And this is where many students get off the track. They say that, you know, they, they look at it and they, they look at classification charts and we're going to look at one of them. But let's make the first decision is the most important one to make. And that decision is whether this is primarily a coarse grain soil or whether it's a fine grain soil. That, that very heavy line to the middle is the 50%. If a soil, if most of the particles by weight pass the number 207 and hit the pan, as we discussed earlier, it is considered a fine grain soil. If they don't, it's a coarse grain soil. They are classified differently. Now, it's true that for coarse grain soils, the fine fraction, the less than 50% fine fraction, it can be um, classified by itself, and that classification determines the class, influences the classification of the whole sample. That's true. You'll hear people talk about, you know, the clay fraction or the fine fraction, you know, and the classification of that. That's true. And we'll see, kind of see that as we go along. But basically the whole track of classifying soils is different for coarse grain soils than it is for fine grain soils. Wait a minute. Yeah, I got, I got it backwards. Excuse me. Fine grain soils and coarse grain soils. Um, the two the classifications are different. So, and they need to be, and that needs to be considered when you're trying to classify a soil. So the track is different. You get the wrong track, you're going to get, you're guaranteed to get the wrong classification. Guaranteed. You won't even be close. Once you get past that, and I'm not sure of a, I'm, I'm going to look and show you an example of how to do that. There are several different types of charts people have used over the years. Um, this is the one, your Souls and Foundations Manual. It's okay um, as far as it goes, but basically the same idea predominates. You start over on the left side of the table 4-9, on the left, you start with, is it a, you know, gravels and sands are the coarse grain soils, and more than 50% is retained on the number 200. Um, and fine grain soils, 50% more passes the number 200. The bottom, um, silts and clays classifications, liquid less, either less than 50%, the lean clays, 50% more the fat clays. But it, this using this table presumes you've made that decision. And we'll see. We're gonna see that in a minute. Then we have to split up. If we if we then go with a gravel or sand, if we have a coarse grain soil, then we have to decide if it's predominantly a gravel or sand. What you do is you take if the if the I know about the coarse fraction and whatnot, but put this way. If more of the sample by weight is larger than the is, is large is larger than the number four is retained in the number four hundred sieve, the gravel portion is larger than the portions that are between the below the four hundred but above uh, the, the, excuse me, uh, before da, da, da. they pass to the number four, but they're retained on the two hundred. If that that portion's larger, it's a sand. 
and I like sometimes to use a pie chart for that to, to illustrate that. On the other hand, uh, if you've got a predominantly fine grain soil, if most of it passes the 200 sieve, then you have to strictly pretty much go by your Atterberg limits um, to determine whether or not it um, um, what what classification is. We're going to see how that goes, but using a plasticity chart. Um, they, uh, one thing you'll notice in this chart is whether it's inorganic or organic. That's an important distinction. However, for my purposes in this course, I generally get, unless I tell you otherwise, a soil is inorganic. The plasticity chart is what you use basically to classify soils which are fine grain and also use the fine grain fraction of the coarse grain soils as well. But let's just focus on the fine grain soils using this chart. If you have, you've got two quantities, liquid limit and plas liquid limit at the bottom and plas plasticity index over here on the left. If you have, a, if you know those two from your Atterberg limits, then the, um, um, then you can plot, then you can use that and whatever zone it falls, then you essentially plot the two, you know, go from your plasticity and data limit. Where they intersect is where the, uh, class, where the soil classifies itself. That's pretty much it for, for um, a fine grain soils. You strictly go by your Atterberg limit. There are two lines which are important. Um, the A line is, and you have the equation for the A line, is um, uh, A or the um, line is basically the separation between uh, clays and silt. Soils that hit below the A line are silts. They have a have relatively low plasticity index and relatively high liquid limits. Soils that are above the A-line are, generally speaking, clays. The U-line, if you hit a soil above U-line, you probably have problems with your data. Traditionally, U-line is the upper limit for everything. And that's the plasticity chart. The, there are equations. Occasionally, you will have recourse to use those equations. If you've got a soil that straddles either the A-line especially the A-line or the U-line, or you you know, want to make sure that if it's above or below, if graphically it's not obvious, you may need to use those equations. Um, one other thing can be used is location of clay minerals. Most of your clay minerals, not all, you know, most of them, uh, particularly the, um, I say that, um, Above, below the A-line were silts, there are also your kaolite clays as well. Uh, your illites and your montmorillonites are between the two. And um, that's not to say that the, um, the that, but um, those are, of course, your montmorillonites are particularly your expansive clays. So those are, those are important to themselves. And that's the one way you can identify a montmorillonite clay is if it's up pushing the U-line. Let's take an example, and there are two curves here, and you might want to keep them in mind. The slide sets, of course, are downloadable separately, so you can actually use you actually use those. We have soil A and soil B. I want to classify it according to unified. So let's start with soil A. Um, soil A has is a uniformity. The uniformity is 8.1. You should verify that for yourself. The curvature coefficient is 0.9. The percentage passing the number 200 sieve is 10%. It's probably, and this number four is 89. If you go back, 
and look at the chart you will you can verify that for yourself for soil a that both of those are true that for the number four um, it is about 89 90 percent and for the um, for the for the 200 sieve it's about 10 percent the coefficients of uniformity and curvature uh, you should verify those using the method I just talked about earlier the one thing you don't have for soil A is the adabrate limits on the sieve analysis as separate you're given and you get one of them gives you a liquid limit of 63 and a plastic limit of 42 you simply subtract the two for a plasticity index of 21 you find and what we want to find is the unified soil classification so let's begin as an example First, what is the percentage of material passing number 200 sieve? Like that's the most important question of them all. It's 10%. Since this um, is, is, is less than 50%, the soil is a cohesionless or coarse grain soil. The remaining uh, G or, or, so that eliminates since it's less than that eliminates all of the M and C classification of soils eliminates them at least we've got a G or an S gravel or sand question two what is the percentage of the coarse fraction which is gravel well if you look at the chart 11% of the sample is retained in the number four sieve that which we talk about, 89% is passing. That represents, now, the formal, nice, proper way of doing it, I talked about pie charts and whatnot, and I may do a tutorial on them online. Um, that represents, the way we do that, we first start out by computing the percentage which is retained of the number 200 sieve. So, the total sample is 100%. The percentage maintained is 10%, so 100 minus 10 is 90%. If you take 11 divided by 90, you get 12.2. So the gravels are 12.2% of the coarse fraction. Obviously, this is not a gravel sample. If it were, that would be 50% or above. So that eliminates the G classification remaining s so in the first two steps we've eliminated all of the uh classic we've eliminated everything but your s we've got rid of your c's the m's and the g's gone so now in the first two that's why your early steps are the most important in classification soil classification how clean are the sands Clean sands are gravels have less than 5% of the material passing the number 200 sieve. Sands or gravels with fines have more than 12%. Uh-oh. We've got a problem. We really do. Because it's 10%. 10% passes the number 200 sieve. We haven't done, accomplished anything. If it had been, say, 4%, we'd have a clean sand. Uh, if it were 12%, we'd have a sand with fines. But we've got, we're kind of in the middle here. What that means is we're going to end up with dual classification. Okay, next question. How is the soil graded? The uniformity coefficient has a CU of 8.1 and a curvature coefficient of C to C of 0.9. For SW, CU is is let is greater than six, and you know if, if for a soil to be well graded for an SW, the CU has to be greater than six, which it is. So it, it passes that, but. The problem is the curvature coefficient needs to be between 1 and 3, and it isn't. It is not an SW. There are four possible classifications of sands. SW, well-graded sands, poorly-graded sands, sands with silt, silty sands, SM, and SC clay sands. So we're limited one. So we're down to three. 
So what are the Atterberg limits? The liquid limit is 63 plus. We went through that. The A-line analysis, and I'm using the A-line equation, is equal to 4 if if um, plastic for a plasticity index is equal for an A-line for at, at oh it's, let's put it this way the um, for at the a at the for the at the liquid limit of 40 of 63 limit ll is equal to 63 this is basically the fine portion of this is a it, it is, a, is, a, is a fat soil so therefore the liquid you know if I put LL into that equation I will get a PI of 31.39 the PI I actually have is 21 that means that the equation is below the A line Therefore, I do not have an SC classification. And you can go back and look at the classification chart to see how I came up with that. So I don't have an SC soil. It's not a clay sand. Because the fine particles are basically silt. I would say SP and SM. So how do I pick which one is that? Well, I said that soils that run between 5 and 12 percent fines inevitably are dual classifications and we but and we back that up by saying this the average limit is below the a line so sm is possible the cu and c are don't mix with sp is possible so the soil in question is subject to a dual classification, or SM-SP. And that's how we came up with this. Dual classification soils are always kind of the trickiest to do. Because you get down to the end of it, and you realize you got a dual classification, you got to make sure you pick the two right ones. The Ashto system. The Ashto system um, is a little different. In that you go from left, you go from left to right. You start with all being possible, and you keep going until you hit something that works, and you stop. You'll notice the breakpoints are very similar to the uh, Unified's breakpoints. Um, you'll notice also they use the Atterbury limits again. Both systems. And I think this is one reason why both systems work as well, you know, succeeds because they work and because they only require the use of sieve analysis and Atterberg limits, both tests which are easily run. Generally speaking, the granular materials are on the left side of the Ashto chart and the silk clay materials are on the right hand side. Um, and they and they use the um, you just go from one to the next. You, by elimination you, you instead of eliminating in a tree you eliminate across the line to stop one other thing I'm going to talk about you notice at the bottom of the chart you have something called the group index and the group index is uh, used on your finer grain soils and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. In fact, I probably what I probably ought to do is just to proceed to that. I have to go back and forth here for just a minute. This is another um, uh, manifestation of the Ashto chart, and the group index form is given at the bottom. The F is the Value is the percent past the number 200 sieve expressed as a whole number, which means they don't want decimal points. LL is the liquid limit, PI is the plasticity index. You can, for soils 826 and up, you consider the group index, but that particular group index formula is only good for the silt clay materials A4, A5, A6, and A7. 
it is never a negative number. If you get a negative group index, you, you make it zero. And in fact, if you have a, um, uh, a soil in that region, you, all, you normally put the group index as part of the classification. Backing up, you'll see this plasticity chart, which is similar to but not exactly like the, um, um, the one you see in the unified system. And for A26 and A27s, you don't use the full group index, you use the partial group index. And again, you, you, you quote the group index the same way as you would with the other soils. So that is, for, for fine grain soils, you include the group index. This is a chart which, which the Ohio Department of Transportation uses. They're the only DOT that I am aware of, and I'm not going to say that this is, that uses ASHTO classification for just about everything they do, um, as opposed to most, most DOTs use the unified system. And you can give, and this is a nice chart because it gives you an idea of what different cla ASHTO classifications mean from a physical standpoint, not just a, you know, number standpoint. All right, same soil as before. I summarize all of the relevant um, class, relevant data from it, the uniformity, the curvature, the, the, the percentage pass number 10. That's new. And number 40 is new. Both of those are new, but they're draw you draw though you can check those for yourself on the gradation curve. And of course the number two hundred is always there. And again the average bird limits, they're the same. Find the ASHTO slow class. So you see already we're you know, the ASHTO classification based on a little bit different look on the system than you have in the unified system. Okay. Examine the SIV pass points. And you need to have, the, the only way to really do this is to look at the chart itself. You start from the left. The number 10 is greater for, than 50%. You move past point A1A. The number 40 is greater than 50%. You eliminate A1 altogether, but A2 is possible. The number 200 is equal to 10%, so A3 is possible. You may not want to hang your hat on, on, on A3 because that's that's pretty much borderline situation. The number 200 is less than 35%, so A2 is possible. So we've only eliminated really the A1 classifications altogether. And A3 is possible. Uh, LL is greater than 40, so eliminate A24 and A26. The, the plasticity is greater than 10. That eliminates A25. That leaves the A27, which meets all three criteria. But remember, you know, A3 is possible. Because this is an A27, we have to use a partial group index. That's plug and chug in front of you. It turns out to be a negative number. So the partial group index for A27 is zero. If, if we're, we, we've gone on, to the A4s and all that stuff, we would have had a um, full group index. But we're using partial, so it's negative, so we make it zero. The classification is A27 with zero partial group index. This is a chart that shows the differences between the two. You can see the grain size breaks are a little different. Um, the uh, unified is different. They're different enough to be a problem. It's interesting to note that the, the two are as similar as they are, considering they're developed entirely differently. The, basically, the um, Bureau of Public Roads, which is now the FHWA, developed it back in the 20s, and Casa Grande developed his for the military 20 years later. So they were separated by quite a bit, and but nevertheless, they are not the, um, um, they, they are different enough to be a problem. They're, they are alike enough where the, the trends can be seen together. So there's not a perfect correspondence between the two. And that concludes um, 
I lecture for soul mechanic for for soul classification and gradation and also the Edinburgh limits. So thanks for watching and God bless.